What is up, everybody? Welcome to the 585 Report. Mitch Broder, and I'm not alongside Ryan Sullivan. He's actually on a trip. I mean, this month's been kind of crazy. I'm sure as you guys have known, I've been out a bunch of times. This time, it's Ryan. Uh, but no worries. You know What we were going to discuss this week, we're going to save it for next week. Uh, we have a really uh, interesting discussion in line, kind of about training camp coming up and, and kind of diving into, you know, position groups, the offense, the defense, really kind of looking at this roster and, and the players on it. But for right now, that's going to be on hold, but don't worry. Do not worry. It will be uh, next week. We will get into that discussion. But for this week, I wanted to actually bring up a, a, a different topic and one that, you know, people aren't so much talking about. And maybe it's because, you know, I'm overthinking things here a little bit, but I just think this is an interesting discussion to have. I want to talk about specifically head coach Sean McDermott. And kind of the question, I guess, for this episode is, does Sean McDermott have what it takes to get the Bills over the hump and into the Super Bowl? I think that's that's kind of what it comes down to. Does he have what it takes? And I kind of listed... Three reasons why he does have what it takes. And I'll explain my, my, my reasons here, of course. And three reasons why I don't think he has what it takes. At the end, I'll give you my honest opinion. If I think Sean McDermott can bring a Super Bowl to Buffalo, plain and simple. Um, so with that, I'm going to get right into it. Starting off with you know my three reasons why McDermott can get this done for the Bills. So I have here in my notes for my very first uh, reason why he can is that throughout his time in Buffalo, he has gotten the most out of his players, hands down. And there's no better examples of this than when you look at the 2017 and 2018 Bills. I mean, those were rosters on paper that were not good. I mean, that 2017 Bills team, right? Uh, at best, on paper, that should have been a seven-win team. They go 9-7 and seven, make the playoffs. I understand they had some help, but... They put themselves in a position to make the playoffs and things aligned right for them. That 2018 Bills team, I don't think people remember how heinous they were the first two weeks of the season when they had, until the you know 2019 Miami Dolphins that did them, the worst point differential in NFL history through two games. And even the lowest of the low point when the Bills were 2-7 and seven, coming off a humiliating loss to the Bears behind another pitiful performance behind... Nathan Pierman's arm, and it kind of just looked like this team was, frankly, going to have the first overall pick in the draft. They looked like they were going to be the worst team in football by far. And to Sean McDermott's credit, with those two teams, he got a lot of those players. I mean, that 2018 Bills team went 6-10, and 10, could have had a better record. I mean, at a few games gone their way, that might have been a 500 football team, maybe even an over 500 football team. I mean, they they played some good football teams. They were competitive. They play tough. And I think for me, at least as a fan, and of course, you know, uh, you know, I don't know coaching that well. I, you know, I'm a younger guy. I haven't seen the NFL for years, but one of the things that I sort of measure, right. If, if a guy has it or not is if they can make bad players look good, right. We've seen this with the Patriots, Bill Belichick, how many guys have had amazing seasons with the Patriots gotten paid elsewhere and just terrible aren't that good aren't as good as you know ever. I mean look at a guy like Trey Flowers a guy who the Bills were interested in right took big money from Detroit had you heard of Trey Flowers since he left the Patriots has he made a Pro Bowls has he been an all pro has he even really been a you know game wrecker right uh, a, a good player in that defense uh, who knows but he's not the guy that the Patriots you know had on their team for a couple of years where he was really started to look like one of the better edge rushers, you know, in the NFL. So Sean McDermott has that, and, and there's proof of it. I mean, think about like an EJ Gaines in 2017, right? Had a career year, hasn't come close to that production, right? Yes, he's had a lot of injuries, but the play hasn't been there either. Even a guy like Leonard Johnson from the 2017 Bills team, you know, got to a rough start, but by the end of the season, there were some Bills fans that wanted the Bills to re-sign Leonard Johnson as the nickelback. You know, Leonard Johnson, I don't even know if the guy's in the NFL at this point. You know, even look at that 2018 Bills team. I mean, there's so many players on that roster that, you know, weren't really that great. And McDermott got a lot out of them. I mean, even think about a Levi Wallace, right? 
a, a UDFA comes out of nowhere and is, you know, one of the top 10 corners in the NFL, according to pro football focus that season. I mean, to me, that is the star mark of, 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 um, you know, great coaching is, can you get a lot out of your players? And not to mention, you know, on those 2017, 2018 bills teams, there were some serious flaws, obviously. I mean, think about the 2018 bills, right? Revolving door at CB two, you know, you had really no one on the defensive line for either of those years, to be honest. Not great quarterback play, not really any receivers to speak of. And yet, those teams were respectable. They weren't half bad. And I think that, to me, that kind of is a sign that he is a, a great coach who can get it done at the end of the day. My second reason why I think that McDermott can get this team over the hump He's analytically, he's, he's analytically driven, excuse me, which is something that we've kind of watched unfold over the last couple of years. This was a guy who initially seemed like that kind of old school, you know, mantra, you know, pound the rock and play good defense and, you know, very not, you know, into sort of this future technology and football. And, you know, to McDermott's credit, he's adapted to it. I mean, think about how aggressive this team was this past season about going for and fourth downs. I mean, they, this was when McDermott's first year, they were the classic, you know, punting on fourth and three from the 45 yard line, you know, on the ops, you know, and, and settling for field goals and just kind of control the clock and play good. D- and that went out the window because the analytics say, you know, fourth and five or less, if you're past a certain point in the field, go for it, you know, and McDermott's done that. And I think that is something that's really important because not only is he just you know, analytically you know, driven with some of his decisions and has really embraced it, considering they have a whole staff of guys on, on, on the team that are just you know, analytical guys who are telling McDermott the probability of this decision and that decision. But it also just shows that he's willing to adapt and adjust to what you know, the football world is and what, what, what is needed to win games. You know, we see that with some of the best teams in the league. Look at the Bruce Arians, the Andy Reeds, right? Kansas City, Tampa Bay, how aggressive they are, how they embrace sort of this new thinking in football, how quickly and innovative they are. And it, and it shows that McDermott's willing to be like that too, which is incredibly important because we saw it with a guy like Rex Ryan, who was very set in his ways, a, you know, old school football ways, right? And in this day and age in football, in the 21st century, that just doesn't get it done. That's not good enough. And 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 McDermott has understood that. He's adapted to it. He's adjusted his coaching style. He's adjusted his decision making to it towards it. And I just think that that is incredibly important. That how he's willing to change and to adapt and to embrace things that maybe he isn't so familiar with or maybe doesn't understand so much, but you know, ultimately leads to more winning. Because that's the thing. At the end of the day, is the guy will do anything to get a competitive advantage, which kind of segues into my kind of final point of why I think Dermot can get it done. And this is a point I'm going to talk about for a little bit, but at the end of the day, the guy's an amazing leader, and there's kind of no denying that. Sean McDermott is a leader of men. And I know you've heard that cliche over the last four years now, and it's probably getting, you know, a little, you know, monotonous and, repetitive and, and almost a, a, a joke at this point, but it's true though. I mean, the players respond to him so well, so positively compared to, I mean, think about the last two head coaches for the bills, Doug Marone and Rex Ryan. I mean, did the players really respond to those guys too well? I mean, think about it, right? With Doug Marone, when the bills beat the lions, right? And I understand, yes, it was a revenge game for, for Jim Schwartz, but when the bills beat the lions, right? In that 2014 season, with that, I think Dan Carpenter hit a bomb of field like at the buzzer, right? It wasn't Doug McDermott, or excuse me, um, Doug Marone, who was carried on the shoulders of the players. It was Jim Schwartz, you know? And from what reports have come out, you know, from, from looking back on it, you know, apparently, you know, unsurprisingly, Doug Marone was not a great leader, and the players didn't like him that much. And it makes you wonder, hey, were those 2014 Bills, who were they? Was that defense playing for Jim Schwartz? Was that kind of their guy? Was it not really Doug Marone? And look at those, you know, 2015, 16 Rex Ryan Bills. 
I'm, I mean, the reports that came out about how disorganized it was and how the players were uncontrollable and all this stuff. I mean, that, listen, at the end of the day, yeah, Rex Ryan was a leader back with the Jets, but when he was here in the Buffalo, there was no leadership to be had. There was no standard set, no culture, right? And Sean McDermott built that over the years. And, and, and almost from day one, you could just see the difference, right? From how the players were. I mean, for me, the the moment where I realized, okay, I think – this guy's different is the NFL mic'd up Sean McDermott for his first game ever. This was back in 2017. I think they were playing the Jets and they win the game. And as you Noah know, McDermott's coming out of the midfield to shake hands with, with, you know, coaches and players, Richie Incognito gives him a big hug and says, there's a great new energy here. You're amazing. Or something along the lines of that. Like there's a great new energy here and this is great. And that's from a guy who has been around in a lot of leagues. And, and also that's a guy who Rex Ryan right? Kind of resurrected his career. He's got Rex, you know, lots of reasons to be thankful for Rex Ryan and Doug Whaley and those guys. And he flat out said at game one, this is way different than what it's been. And thank God that it is. And I think that that kind of spoke to right out of the gate, who Sean McDermott is as a leader, as a kind of how he sets this culture, the standard we hear about all the time. I mean, it's for real. It's legitimate. And there's a lot of reasons why I think this culture is so good and how he's such a leader. You know, at the end of the day, right, he lets his guys be themselves. Yes, they're business. You know, he wants guys that love football. He doesn't want guys that are troublemakers. But at the end of the day, he lets his guys be themselves. I mean, think about all the videos we see in practice of the guys dancing together, throwing snowballs at each other, you know, going out to dinner and joking around and you know, let's, he just lets them embraces who they are, their personalities and lets that shine. And I think that ultimately leads to him empowering players and players will do anything for return partially because of that, because he lets them be themselves and feel comfortable with who they are. And I think that McDermott has the perfect balance of fun and work because I think a guy like Doug Marone, who was all business all the time, right? Players didn't seem to enjoy that. And then you had a Rex Ryan who let the players have too much fun. It wasn't serious enough and it wasn't treated as a profession and a job. And McDermott kind of has that right, perfect balance of we're here to work. We're here to get better. We work our ass off, but Hey, we're going to have some fun and do some team bonding stuff and, and let the, and let these guys be themselves and have fun while they're here. And I think that that is an incredibly important balance that McDermott has. And it's really, I think unusual and only seen with some of the best, Coaches and organizations, again, I think you see stuff like this with like Andy Reid, Mike Tomlin, Pete Carroll. And these are, again, Super Bowl winning coaches. These are the these guys, these guys are at the top of the mountain when it comes to coaching. And, and McDermott, again, has a lot of similarities like that. And like I mentioned, you know, with the competitive advantage thing, I, again, this kind of leads to the culture. Like, think about it with just the, the media coverage, right? That's allowed last offseason and this offseason, right? I mean, for, for, for God's sake, guys. Chris Brown, who is the Buffalo Bills' own insider, couldn't attend a practice for a couple days, had his credentials taken away because he said too much about the depth chart and the lineup and everything like that. And I don't think I don't know how many other NFL teams are you know are, are employing this whole kind of you know media situation where again the media members can't discuss the depth chart, they can't discuss who's running with the ones and the twos, they can only say you know, the plays that happened and if a guy looked good or not, they can't do anything about the depth chart and strategy. And, you know, again, this is just McDermott trying to get a competitive advantage over anyone at anything he possibly can. I mean, think about it even when he just speaks to the media, how he will give them no sound bites, almost, you know, very little to really kind of munch on. It's always very buttoned up, very hush hush, kept in the building. And I know it's silly, and I know as fans, you know, we crave the content. We want McDermott to say, this is what's happening. But you kind of have to tip your hat to the guy how he knows, hey, if I say anything, maybe maybe a, you know, a defensive coordinator hears, oh, shoot, you know, Isaiah Hodgins is running with the ones. They have the 6'4 receiver. You know, that's something to consider. I know this is kind of a, you know, a little bit of a crazy example, but, you know, that but, but that's just to kind of say, you know, hey, he will not let – any other teams around the league know what is going on in one Bills Rise outside of the very basics. You know, you got the tape, you can read what the reporters write, and that's all you're getting. And I think that 
again, with the culture, it kind of speaks to how competitive, how much this guy wants to win. And it's, again, it's kind of a, you know, a comical thing at this point, but, you know, it, it's led to success. It's led to the results we've seen from this organization, from this football team, how the turnaround he's, he's caused, he's, he's made possible. And I just think, you know, you can't take that lightly. So again, the points I have for why I think McDermott to get it done, because I know I did a lot of talking, went through things quick, so I'm going to kind of rehash things again, was number one, he gets the most out of his players. Uh, you know, I mentioned EJ Gaines, Leonard Johnson, even a guy like Ryan Davis, led the Bills in sacks in 2017, not in the NFL anymore. Didn't make it on either rosters, but that was a guy that McDermott got a lot of. So again, gets a lot of a, out, out of his players. Prime examples are the players I just mentioned, and just in general, the 2017-2018 Buffalo Bills teams. Horrible rosters that yet McDermott was able to almost be 500 with it through those two years. I think he was uh, 14, was he 15, 17, I believe, through those two years, which is for, for those rosters, I'm not sure how many other coaches could have gone just about 500 uh, with the talent he had. Number two, he's analytically driven. He's embraced changes in football. He's adapted to what they're, you know, to what the trends are. And the analytics, you know, throughout the entire 2020 season never failed the Bills. And he stuck to it for the most part. I will get to that, though, why I say the most part, not the whole time. But again, analytically driven, but in general, he embraces sort of what is new in football. And number three, he's a leader of men. The culture he's built, you know, again, it's a cliche. It's a joke around Buffalo. But like, let's be honest here. It's for real. And it's and it's it's embraced the players personalities. It's really empowered them. And it's, again, it's led to results. It's led to proven winning. Now, four years, and this guy is one of the top coaches in the NFL for a reason. And this culture is a big reason why. So those are my three reasons why I think McDermott can get it done. And honestly, like I mentioned, with all the things I just mentioned, these are all sort of pillars of great coaches. And McDermott clearly has them, which I think is really crucial here. We're sort of talking about this discussion of if McDermott can get the Bills to the Super Bowl. Now, I'm going to be honest, though. There are some things that do worry me a little bit. And, and I have some three reasons why I am hesitant to fully say, yeah, he can do it. And I'm going to start with, with number one. And this is one that I know Bills fans have been talking about on Twitter, especially this past season in particular. Uh, but I'm going to get right into it. Right into it. At the end of the day, McDermott wants these young guys to earn it, which, again, is a part about building this culture, which is important. It's really a big deal. But that being said, there's been a lot of instances where he will stick right with a veteran over a younger player or rookie, despite how obvious the rookie is better than the vet. And I know everyone's probably thinking about Dane Jackson, but I actually want to pause that for a minute because I actually think there are some better examples than Dane Jackson. For me, the, the clear, obvious example of this and, I will say that this one you know, was year one, and it was a fifth-round pick rookie. But let's be honest, guys. When he had Ramon Humber in over Matt Milano for weeks, I mean, it was at least half, half, it was past the midway point in the season, I believe, when Matt Milano finally got some starts. That, to me, was the clear and obvious of, okay, Sean, what's going on here? Because Ramon Humber, you know, veteran, good guy to have in the locker room, a pretty solid special teams player, but as a regular linebacker, a starter outside, weak side linebacker, he was terrible. I mean, I remember time and time again of him just getting toasted in coverage, burned by running backs and tight ends, struggling in, in zone coverage against the slots, and he just simply didn't have the ability to really be a legitimate every down linebacker. And Matt Milano came in and made plays. He was great in coverage. He was good against the run. He was so quick and fast. And he was exactly kind of the modern linebacker and the guy that really excels in this McDermott 4-3 scheme. And it was just so strange that he, you know, never put him in. But as we've now come to learn, this is kind of what McDermott does. And that to me was just, you know, in that season, I remember feeling like, you know, kind of, you know, what the hell? Look at 20, you know, 19, right? Had Frank Gore as the starter over Devin Singletary until the very end of the year. But my God, I mean, Devin Singletary from preseason football, 
looked like he was the most dynamic running back the Bills had on the roster. And Frank Gore, although he got off to a decent start in 2019, I mean, he fell off so much at the end. And again, it was just one of those things where it's obvious that Singletary's better. Give him the touches. Give him the snaps over Gore. And then last year, of course, everyone's, you know, everyone's sort of poster child, I guess you could say, of of some, you know, uh, of this this problem, I guess you could say, this this whole debate, right? Having Dane Jackson essentially on the on on the practice squad the entire season and never even elevating him to the 53 man roster despite the flashes. Now, I want the reason why I wanted to pause on the Dane Jackson discussion was just because the Bills were in a particular situation, right? This is a team that was contending for a Super Bowl. He's a 7th round rookie, and I will say unlike with Ramon Humber and Frank Gore, you know, say what you want, but you know, Levi Wallace is not nearly as bad as I think those two guys were during the season, during the 2020 season. Because at the end of the day, at, at, at worst, he's a middle-of-the-pack average player. And that's not bad. I think that Humber and Gore were, frankly, bad uh, in their respective seasons. But nonetheless, though, there was no denying that when Dane Jackson entered the game. It was, a, I mean, there was an obvious difference. There was playmaking there. So to sum it all up, essentially, the Bills are at this point now, right, where we're talking about them contending for a Super Bowl, winning a Super Bowl, right? This idea, the culture's been built, right? Like there's a clear kind of pecking order for, for the players. And there's a clear kind of understanding, hey, you come here, you earn it, yada, yada, yada. But this seems, again, they're trying to win a Super Bowl. And the days of, oh, we need to keep the rookie behind the vet, you know, so they really, no. If he's better, put him in the game because this team cannot afford to have below average players in the game when they could be having guys out there who can make a difference, who can make some plays, who can do some things that the current starter can't. Uh, you know, and again, it's different when you're 6-10, and 10, when you're a rebuilding football team. But this is a 13-win team that was a game wave in the Super Bowl. And that, that frankly, that shit's got to end soon. You know, he's got to cut it out at some point. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll see because I think I think Basham and Rousseau, if one of these two, if one of those two guys, if not both of them, come out and look really good this season, I'm going to be curious it's just to see kind of what the snap count looks like with them compared to the likes of Jerry Hughes and Mario Addison. You know, I think it's going to be interesting. The only time I think McDermott truly has gotten away sort of with this idea of letting the rookies earn it was with Ed Oliver, who was not a starter really so much as rookie season. But Jordan Phillips ended up having a career that year, you know, led the team in sacks. So he kind of got away with it then, but he hasn't so much other times. And I just think that at this point, enough of having the young guys earn it, it's about what gives you the best chance to win football games. And if the rookie gives you the best chance to win games over the vet, put the rookie in. So my second point, again, first point was bad vets over rookies. That's number one. Point number two. I mentioned it with the you know aggressiveness and going forward and forth down and the analytics, but I just wrote in my notes here, killer instincts with a question mark. And it was very odd to me that all season and all throughout the playoffs, how aggressive the Bills were on offense, how they were always going forward on fourth down, touchdowns, taking shots. They didn't give a damn. They knew that they had one of the top quarterbacks in the game and they went for it and it worked for them time and time again. But then at the AFC Championship game against the Chiefs, it's like McDermott chickened out of these decisions. You know, they settled for those two chip shot field goals that did nothing, nothing in the score. When you needed a touchdown, you needed to tighten the gap between you and the Chiefs, and they settled for field goals, right? I think one time they were down 12, the other one down 15. Point being is that wasn't going to cut it. Settling for field goals doesn't beat the Kansas City Chiefs, and they were – playing for field position. It was just like McDermott kind of reverted back to what we saw the last, you know, three seasons before this year. It was just very, for me, kind of concerning because 
this is not what we saw all year. And when it mattered most, when all, you know, when it was for all the marbles, for the biggest moment, right, for this Bills team. And I'm not trying to be a pessimist here or anything, but let's be honest, though. Like, you don't know the next time the Bills are going to be the AFC Championship game. It might not be next year. It might not be until like three, four, five years from now. Like, you just don't know. The playoffs, with single elimination, anything can happen. And, and there's a lot of good teams in the AFC now. So, like, it's not so easy to get to that point. And, you know, he he played very conservatively in that game. And I just, I was not a fan of that at all. And it really kind of concerned me because, again, this was not what we saw all year that had worked, that had gotten you to 13-3, and three, that had gotten you into that position. So I guess my question is, what happened? And will that happen again? Because, you know, it was just kind of concerning that when everything was on the line, he pulled back. And for my final point, and this is more of kind of a question, because I'll be honest, there's not really a lot to kind of, you know, get a McDermott on other than I think the two things I mentioned. But I think this is a legit question to ask, though, nonetheless, is, you know, can he outcoach the best? We saw him against Andy Reid twice last year. Andy Reid got him both times. Pretty bad, right? Mike Vrabel got him pretty bad in that Titans game. I understand there's a lot of tough circumstances with that, but, you know, Vrabel outcoached him. And it just does make you wonder. Now, again, I mean, McDermott's beaten a lot of great coaches. Frank Reich last year, Jim Harbaugh, both the guys in the playoffs. And those are, or John Harbaugh, yeah, John Harbaugh, excuse me, John Harbaugh, not Jim. John Harbaugh, you know, those are two uh, excellent coaches. And, you know, McDermott did beat him in the playoffs. You know, he he beat Bill Belichick twice this year, I, albeit the Patriots roster was pretty, you know, piss poor. And he hasn't really been a good Patriots roster. So we'll see if he can, you know, because this Patriots team is not going to be a complete disaster like they were in 2020. You know, he's definitely better than some of the more mediocre coaches. I mean, there's no question. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, guys like Cliff Kingsbury, and obviously like an Adam Gase, I mean, McDermott kind of took him to school at times and he, you know, he's had his moments of, uh, of, of really kind of out scheming, you know, and out coaching a lot of coaches in the league, but in order to be the best, you know, you got to beat the best. And again, with that, with how this AFC is, you're going to go through a good team, whether it's the chiefs, the Ravens, the Browns, maybe it's even the chargers this year, who the hell knows point being is you're going to have to beat a really good football team. That's probably not a really good coach. And, you know, can McDermott be like Andy Reid, be like Bill Belichick, be like Bruce Arians and get the best of those guys? I, you know, I'm not sure I can just full on say, hell yeah, he can, because it's been a little mixed, you know? And again, it kind of reverts back to what I was talking about with his kind of bizarre conservative game planning and decision making against some of these top teams, because... He'll be aggressive as hell against teams that have kind of no chance against the Bills, but you play a team that's, you know, the best or one of the best, and it's a little, you know, and it hasn't always been like that. So those are kind of two things, you know, th so those, that, that's something that kind of just um, concerns me a little bit. So again, the three reasons why I'm not sure McDermott can do it is keeping the veterans over the rookies, even if there's a clear talent disparity, you know, kind of reverting back to his old habits, and the AFC Championship game. And simply, is he, can he outcoach the best of the best? He's got a pretty resume who he's beaten, but, you know, outside of Harbaugh, Frank Reich, and I guess Mike Tomlin, I mean, he beat, he beat Bill Belichick with a, you know, with a bad Patriots team. Mm, you know, it's just something to kind of consider and, and just to, you know, wonder, hey, you know, does he have what it takes? So that kind of leads me, I guess, to sort of my final thought here as I kind of wrap up this episode. I know it's a little brief, um, but things were kind of last minute. So this is, uh, you know, couldn't do a ton of planning here, but I'm going to kind of give you my honest opinion here. Do I think he can do it? Do I think he is good enough to get this team over the hump into the Super Bowl and where, frankly, they probably should be? And my answer to this question is, on, as I have here in my notes in all caps, hell yeah, he can. And I'll explain myself. Yes, I did talk about kind of things that are concerning and things that he needs to, you know, maybe not doing, but, or, or stop doing, excuse me. But at the end of the day, his career record speaks for itself, right? I mean, he's got himself a pretty darn good resume here. Um, he's been a lot of very good teams. He's gotten to the playoffs. 
um, you know, three of the last four years. I mean, the guy in four years has won 40 games for the Bills. 40, right? And has had three winning seasons. Like, he's a good coach. He's a top 10 coach. Almost a top five coach. I think if he can get if if he gets to a Super Bowl, he's a top five coach. Hands down. Just like with Josh Allen, kind of in this discussion, is he the is he in that top five elite of the elite? I think the same discussions for Sean McDermott. If he gets that Super Bowl, he's top five elite of the elite. He's up there with the Sean McVeighs. He's up there with the Bill Belichicks. He's up there with the Bruce Arians and the Andy Reeds. He's in that tier. He's he's just short of it right now, but if he can get into the Super Bowl, he'll be right there with him. And as I've said, what I talked about were my reasons why. And I, and I mean that those three things to me are clear pillars of great coaching. And he, and he for sure has them. And at the end of the day, in a short off season with a lot of new pieces, with a defense that was lacking, with a run game that was struggling. Yes. He had Josh Allen. Yes. They had a great receiving core, but McDermott needs to get credit here for the fact that despite the bills flaws, because they had some pretty substantial flaws, you know, no pass rush, you know, no CB2, things of that nature. And this team was a game away from the Super Bowl. And I think that although we'll, you know, you can't say for sure it's going to happen next year or the year after, it, you know, it's impossible to predict. I mean, the Packers were 13 3 at the MVP and, and, and didn't make it to the Super Bowl. You know, the Ravens went 14 2 a season ago, had the MVP and didn't make it out of their first playoff game. You never know these kind of things. It's the, the playoffs are crazy. And right now with this AFC in particular, I mean, there's at least five, maybe six teams that you could legitimately argue could win a Super Bowl this season. And that's pretty tough. You know, it's, it's a tough task ahead of them. But for me, though, looking at Sean McDermott, what he's done and how he is as a coach, I think that with the pieces they have and with his ability as a head coach and everything I've mentioned here, he can get it done. I really do. I really firmly believe that he has what it takes to get this team up that over that hill, over the hump, and into the playoffs. Or excuse me, rather, the Super Bowl. Because, hey, championship caliber, guys. Championship caliber. So those are kind of my three reasons why I think McDermott can do it. Three reasons why I don't. I am a little hesitant. And overall, if I really do believe he can. So I'm obviously curious to hear, you know, what you guys think. So please, you know, light me up on Twitter if you agree or disagree with me. I, you know, I love to hear your feedback. Love to hear what you guys have to think. Um, next week will be a more normal episode. There's no need to kind of panic here because Ryan will be back. And we're going to get more into sort of the uh, training camp kind of previewing here. Again, we're going offense, defense, really discussing the players uh, position by position, kind of giving our thoughts and you know, maybe even giving a little 53-man roster projection, possibly, uh, which everyone seems to really love. So we will probably do uh, something like that uh, in the coming days here in the, in the, in the future. Um, but once training camp starts, though, we're going to be full go. Um, like I said, I, I mentioned last episode, I've been doing a uh, an internship this summer, so I've been a little busy. Uh, but luckily, it ends the day training camp starts. So that week, me and Ryan will be, like, ready to go, full on, all in, you know, for, for training camp. Uh, but... And, and, of course, we'll keep you updated uh, with everything that's going on. So uh, with that being said, thank you so much, guys, for listening. Uh, keep your ears and eyes open and for any announcements that we have. And, of course, we'll let you know. Uh, and with that, thank you for listening. Signing off for Mitch Broder. Have a great rest of your day.